Welcome to the SETI Colloquium series. This afternoon we have Jan Janice Bishop speaking uh, to us um, about her spectroscopic studies on Mars. Janice got her bachelor's degree in chemistry and her master's degree in applied earth science, um, remote sensing, with a focus on remote sensing. And then she has a PhD in chemistry and planetary studies from Brown University. So she's kind of a local girl. She did her, her bachelor's and master's degree here um, in this area up at Stanford and then went over to Brown and then is back now for the past 10 years working as a principal investigator here at the SETI Institute and at NASA Ames. She works on a number of Mars projects, both um, surface and orbital. She's a member of the CRISM team, um, which is an orbital instrument, and she's also a part of the Mars Exploration Rover Science team. So working with with data from the ground. And she's going to talk to us both about, about both of those today. She also does Mars analog studies here on Earth. Um, and I think she's going to wrap that into our presentation too. So we have a lot of stuff to look at today. And the title of her talk, The Surface of Mars, Mineralogy as an Indicator of Water and Environmental Conditions. So um, to start off, I'm talking about the surface of Mars. And these are some of the current missions. Um, Mars Odyssey um, and MRO have been flying recently. Mars Express is a European mission, and this is um, from the Mars Exploration Rover. We're using these missions and the instruments on them to identify minerals in the rocks and soil, and we're also using analog studies, and basically anything we can get to try to interpret this data. So what do we know about Mars? It's um, a little smaller than Earth and bigger than the Moon. And we, instead of days, we have something called a sol. And each one is 24.6 Earth hours. And if you think, oh, well, that's not too different. That must be convenient. Well, and it is pretty close. But for those working on the rover teams, that 0.6 of an hour, that half an hour day, got to be quite a lot. Because these people tried to stay on Mars time. So each day, their time was shifted by about half an hour. So you can imagine after a couple weeks, their day was pretty scrambled compared to you know, when they left uh, JPL and went outside to have a meal or <laughs> see if the sun was up or not. And this is uh, a view of Mars. I'm going to, so I don't confuse myself, I'm going to try to keep my pointer over here. OK. The, the planet has poles at the north and south that have a lot of ice, and they're white in these images. And then there's dust and rocks across most of the planet. And it's mostly basaltic in nature. And this again shows um, one of those images of the planet. And here is where um, Pathfinder landed. This shows you some of the features that we see, some of the aqueous features that have been seen for a while in images from Vi Mariner and Viking, and which led some people to think there might be water on the planet. <laughs> And these are some maps that show us about the planet. So here, this is something called MOLA, Mars Orbiter Laser Altimetry. And basically, it's topography. So it shows you that there's a lot of variation in the height of the surface. And this is a map of hydrogen from the gamma ray spectrometer. And hydrogen can be water, water ice that's in the surface, kind of like the permafrost at Alaska. Or it can be OH that's in minerals like clays and sulfates. And then on the right, we have maps of the mineralogy from TESS, the thermal emission spectrometer. And so basalt and andesite are two different kinds of rocks. And so these maps show that we have variation in the kinds of rocks on the surface. And so how do we go about learning about Mars? In my mind, it's kind of a puzzle. And basically, we'll take any data we can get and try to figure out what we can about the planet. And it's not as always, it's not always as easy as you would hope, but we have landers, um, such as the Mars Exploration Rover, Phoenix, um, which went up last year, and MSL, which is coming up soon, hopefully. Orbiters, um, such as Odyssey or MRO. And then we have meteorites. This is, is an example of one. And we have analogs, Earth analog sites that we study. So starting with some of the landers, I'll be talking about some of the Mars Exploration Rover results from Gusev Crater and Meridiani Crater, and then a summary of some of the Phoenix results. 
So to start off with, this is the, the MER, and we have a mini test and a pancam spectrometer at the top. And on the rover arm down here, there's APXS, which gives us chemistry, MOS power, which gives us iron, information about the iron, and the microscopic imager, which is like a microscope. It tells us the sample texture and gives us some information about the grain sizes. And so what do we know about GUSEF? This is where the, the rover Spirit was. We see a lot of brown, barren rock. And most of you have seen this on the news, and this isn't too new. So most of this, we see a few mafic rocks and lots and lots of dust that covers everything. And still, our instruments were able to glean some information out of this, especially with the, the rock abrasion tool, the rat that ground off some of the surface and can look through. And these are some of the data from PanCam, and these are the Mossbar data. So this told us a little bit about the mineralogy. And it, it wasn't too new. It was basically what we knew before, that it's basaltic and there's some dust. And then um, something fortuitous happened. One of the wheels got stuck on the rover. And when it was driving along, it scooped up a whole bunch of this yellow and white stuff that got stuck in the wheel. And often in science, you plod along and something unexpected happens. And it's what you do with that unexpected that actually could be important, whether you just ignore it or whether you say, ah, this is something important. And so in this case, we saw this yellow and white stuff that was pulled up from underneath by the rover wheel. And of course, the scientists on the team zapped that with everything possible to try to find out what the chemistry and mineralogy of this interesting stuff is. And one of the techniques they used was spectroscopy. And I'm going to give you a little aside here. These blue, green, and red plots here, this corresponds to the wavelengths that, of light that our eyes see. And the way the PanCam spectrometer works, there are 11 channels across here. And we can get information about the color. And instead of 11 channels or 500 channels, our eyes have basically these three. So we're averaging the, the energy that's observed in this range into these three colors. And when we work with planetary data, we do the same thing. We can collect as many wavelengths as we like. But then in order to plot it, to look at maps, we can really only plot three colors at a time. So we pick three, and we plot them here. And so this is what this soil looks like that was exposed by the rover wheels in basically true color, what it, approximately true color. And then we use different maps with other three colors to try to enhance some of the mineral features in order to try to focus on the differences in the mineralogy and try to figure out what that is. So here, the green and the red enhance the differences that we see in this scene. And these are the 11 channels that we can measure in from the PanChem spectrometer. These are the, the Mars spectra at the bottom. So th these are the Sol numbers. So the Sol is the day. So at day 400 or day 721, for example, those are the days that the rover collected the material. And these are the shape of the spectra that were collected. And this, what's really unusual here is this sort of rays that we see at this point. That's at 670 nanometers. And when we look at a lot of minerals, a lot of them look more like this in this region. These, this, the shape in this region is mostly due to the iron. But there are a few sulfate and phosphate minerals that have this sort of bump here that looks a little bit like what we see here. So we've, we've determined that there are a couple kinds of unique sulfates and phosphates that could be responsible for this yellow and white material that the rover wheels dug up. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Only, even with the limited 11 channels that we get from PanCam, we're still able to say something about the mineralogy because the pattern is so unusual for, for this white and yellow material. And so moving on to Meridiani, we've probably heard a lot more about this even in the news. This, um, these are the layered rocks that have the gypsum and gerasite in them, and the little spherules or blueberries that turned out to be hematite. So again, these are the PanCam spectra. This is what they look like. And this is the Mossbauer spectra. And this is from mini tests. So we've been using these kind of data and comparing them with our libraries from the lab, from minerals, and from analogs to try to understand these. And this is from HiRISE. Then HiRISE is the camera that flew with CRISM on MRO. And I'll be talking mostly about CRISM data. But when HiRISE flew over, this is Victoria Crater, it actually captured the rover, which is coming pretty soon here, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. There it is. OK. Just going to zoom in on a little bit. 
you can see the scale of the rover compared to the crater. I think that's the end. Okay. And then from Phoenix, this is what the Phoenix lander looks like. There's a, a rover arm that scoops up some of the, the soil and surface material for, for tests, and it's measured some carbonates in the soil, and it's been measuring the water content, and it's been measuring the chemistry. There's some perchlorate also. Uh, mostly magnesium perchlorate. And also where the scoop scooped the material out, we saw this white stuff that um, turned out to be ice from some measurements that they made. And if you look carefully down here, I guess if you have really good eyes, you can see where this black arrow is, see if I can point this properly. There are three little white dots right here, if you look carefully. And in, this is SAL 20. So in SAL 24, if you look carefully here, these thr three little white dots are gone. And so the idea is that the, the ice that was exposed here has then melted, actually sublimed, because it's not, um, liquid water is not, solid, uh, not stable on the surface of Mars, so it would have just sublimed. And so back to our puzzle pieces, um, the next phase I'm going to talk about are the, um, the orbiter data. And here we have several different orbiters, or we have spectral data we've collected from several different means, and for scale, this is the telescopic data. For years and years, in the, the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s, we collected telescopic data, and that was, that was really the only means of getting information, because we just couldn't get spectral data. Um, we didn't have orbiters. A mariner did collect some, but it, the, we just didn't have the spectral data we needed to really gain information about the surface. So anyway, when the telescope measured the surface, they're measuring the whole planet, and you might get one or two spots. So we're averaging the whole planet into the spectra. So it was a pretty big mishmash of everything. And then in the 90s, um, actually 89, um, the Russian Phobos mission flew, and ISM, a French instrument, measured tens of kilometers wide. And I think they got data for two or three weeks before it died. And then Omega flew um, a few years ago and was in between these steps um, and was on the scale of uh, 300 to 1,500 meters, but I think most of the data is close to a kilometer resolution. And now CRISM can run either at 18 meters per pixel or at 200 meters per pixel, so it's a big step forward. And in comparison with um, the orbiter data, this is PanCam, which is on the scale of tens of centimeters. So if you're on the surface, of course, you can get spectral data at a much higher resolution. So this summarizes um, the ISM. And Tess, I didn't mention, this is in the thermal emission region. And this is at longer wavelengths. It gives you different spectral information, which is different properties of the minerals. But it's also at, I think, three to five kilometer resolution. So CRISM was really a big step forward for us. And we've been now around collecting data for two and a half years and getting a lot more information about the mineralogy. Oops. Okay, so how do we collect a spectral information about the surface? We first of all, we need a light source, and the sun is a handy light source for us in remote sensing, and we need a surface, a rock, to uh, reflect the light off of, and then we need a detector. So either an eye or a spectrometer. And you can also emit, emit light at different wavelengths from the surface. And so this is what the spectrum looks like. You basically have sort of a flat curve. And then where you have these dips or peaks in the spectrum, that's where the molecules in the surface vibrate and absorb the energy. So what we're interested in is not so much this general curve, but these little peaks in here, because that tells us about the mineral structure. And so in more detail, some of the things that we're most looking at with CRISM are clays. And these are three examples, the kaolinite, nontronite, and chlorite. And I picked these examples because they have different cations. The kaolinite has aluminum, nontronite has iron, and chlorite has magnesium. So if you look at these peaks up here, these are due to OH and water and OH in the mineral structure. And the differences you see here are due to the differences in the metal cations. So if you look at the mineral structure, you see these OH bonds, and you see these different M's here. M is for these metals that could be different kinds in the mineral structure. So if you change the kind of metal here, it's going to change the nature of these OH bonds, and it's going to vibrate at a slightly different energy. And so we can measure that with a spectra. 
And just to provide a little more information, these are what the mineral structures look like for these three example clays. And again, they're color coded up here for the three different kind. And one more, whoops, that was too fast. So for these features we're looking at, this is the iron region, iron OH, and this is the magnesium OH, and this is the aluminum region. And in some cases, this aluminum for the kaolinite, this is divided into two or more bands, but the montmorillonite is also aluminum, and that's here. But just by the position of these bands, you can tell what kind of clay mineral this is. And then in this region, too, magnesium occurs out here, iron here, and aluminum approximately here. And so we use these peaks, the center of the wavelength and also the shape of the band in order to determine what kind of mineral it is. And back to CRISM again, this is an image of the instrument down here. And this shows you the resolution. So when CRISM's flying and collecting data in high resolution, this is about 18 meters per pixel. And you can see the kind of resolution. This is an example over uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And if it's running at 100 or 200 meters per pixel, this is what it approximately looks like. So if, if you're looking, for example, um, for differences in mineralogy here, you could see the character of the blue and green spots, which refer to different minerals. And at 100 or 200 meters per pixel, you can still see these, but it's harder to associate the blue and the green with actual surface features. Whereas in this case, you can actually see better the shape of the volcano and the shape of the surface and the kinds of rocks, and you can better associate the green and blue <coughs> minerals, the minerals shown by the represented by the green and blue colors <coughs> with actual surface features. And so this is an example from Juventic Chasma, and here we have these sulfate mounds, and that's shown the, the purple and the sort of yellow green are two different kinds of sulfates in this giant mound. It's basically sort of a mountain inside this huge canyon. And then on the sides of these, we have outcrops of different kinds of mafic minerals. And here are the examples of the spectra. So the pyroxene is shown here in this patch and the olivine in this patch. And then these two different sulfates are shown over here where these arrows are. So we use CRISM to look at spectra like this that we pull out of these images to try to map the minerals that we see, to try to learn information about how the surface formed and especially water, what the nature of the water was. And the different minerals we see can tell us information about how long water might have been present or if it was acidic or neutral. And this shows an image of these mounds that I was just talking about. This mound B was the one that you saw in the previous image. So these, you could see the layering in here. This is from the sulfates. And then this is the chasma wall. And this is some dune sand. So this dark material has a weakly mafic nature. Here we have some olivine and pyroxene in the canyon walls, but it's mostly covered by dust. And the bright white material here are these sulfates that we see. So this is kind of an interesting place on Mars where we see these giant mountains of sulfates. <coughs> and they're very bright compared to the dark canyon walls and the dark dune soil. I think that's about done. Nice long movie. Okay, and now I'm going to talk about some phyllosilicates, some different clay outcrops that CRISM is, has identified on Mars. So here are six different spots I'm going to talk about, and it shows that phyllosilicates are observed across, across a wide range of the planet. And here to start with um, is Marth Vallis, and these are s several of the CRISM footprints across the surface. And if we then map the mineralogy with CRISM, we can map the different clay layers with different colors. And then this is a CTX, a context imager, context imager mosaic, and then map these different colors for the different kinds of clays that we've seen. We can get an idea of the stratigraphy of these. And in, in the case of Marth Vallis, we actually see broad expanses of these. So the clay that we see at the bottom is this iron-rich clay that's called natronite, and we see that across the bottom, and that's a really thick layer. And then on top of that, we see layers of other clays. In this case, we see an, an opaline material and a montmorillonite and a kaolinite. And what these mean is that there's differences in the water, the in aqueous environment. So perhaps changes in pH or changes in the ions that were in the solution. But what we see is the same stratigraphy across um, 10,000 square meters, basically. It's a huge area. So right around the center of Marth Vallis, we see really dense outcrops of these clays, but around the broader area where there's some impacts, we see glimpses of these through these windows. And 
basically on Mars, you don't see the clays covering the surface because other things have covered them over. So you have to look for places where you either have an impact to dig up the surface and throw the clays out, or some kind of other surface processes that eroded the capping material. So that we can see the clays were formed a long time ago. So in this area, um, where we see these craters, for example, or other erosional processes, they might have removed some of the clays, and then we can see them peeking through here. And this then, from high rise, we can look at the textures of these two different kinds of clay layers, and we can see differences. And two of my students this summer are working on characterizing this. This is another example. This is a little close up. So this is a chrism image. This shows you the differences in the nontronite at the bottom and the montmorillonite in blue at the top. And these are what the spectra look like. So the chrism spectra are the noisier ones in each pair. This is the chrism spectrum. And then this is the lab spectrum of a similar kind of clay. This is the nontronite, the iron magnesium smectite. Montmorillonite shown here in blue. So this is the chrism spectrum and the lab spectrum. And then this is an opaline spectrum in um, green and the lab spectrum and then kaolinite. And so if you look here, I, I tried to put some lines in so you can try to see the kaolinite here. This has a little, dub, a little doublet in the chrism spectrum, and you can see that in the lab spectrum too. And then the opal has a broad feature here, whereas the montmorillonite has a narrower feature. So we see that difference. And then the nontronite has these features out at longer wavelengths. So we really can use chrism to distinguish well the kinds of clay minerals, even though they're a clay. And to first order, it's kind of similar when you think about um, a, a mafic rock, like an olivine or a pyroxene or a sulfate rock, we can still use chrism to identify very subtle differences in the clay mineralogy. And this, when we uh, overlay the chrism image over MOLA, then it looks like this. And this next one, this shows you um, the topography. So you can see a little better the nontronite in orange is at the bottom, and then the montmorillonite and kaolinite, the aluminum phyllosilicates are at the top in blue. And we'll run again. At least for me, when you see the image moving, you can see the, the topography a little better. And we use this often on our screen, besides being fun. It's, uh, it's actually useful. So it's, it's kind of neat when um, a fun thing is actually useful for your science, too. And that happens in this case. And so we've, we've built this together to form a stratigraphy that uh, we can analyze in the lab. The nontronite is at the bottom, and the aluminum phyllosilicates at the top. And then we thought a little bit about how this might form. And so there was probably a basalt and then a basaltic rock. This was early in the Noachian, about 4 billion years ago. Then there was basaltic ash in an aqueous environment with a lot of water. And this formed the smectite. And then after that, there was probably a secondary aqueous event. And either the ash might have had a different chemistry, or it was just leached so that the iron and the magnesium and the potassium was leached out to the bottom. And then we formed these other minerals at the top that were poor in iron and magnesium. So we're still working on understanding this, but it must have been a huge process if we've got the same stratigraphy over a, a wide area. And one other thing we see from Marth Vallis, inside some of the craters, we see different spectra. This one is a magnesium-bearing um, smectite called a saponite. And so these bands are at a slightly different position. And this is rather a rare outcrop, but this is a giant crater. So it could be a different process happened in this one place. And then moving on to another part of the planet, this is called Nili Fosse, and this region's been in the news a lot. Um, this region has a whole myriad of clays. Instead of at Marth Vallis, where we have a giant area and we see the same thing in these layers, instead at Nili, they have sort of pockets of all different kinds of things. And this is kind of like going to Baskin Robbins with 31 flavors, that every time you look at a different part of the, the region, you see a different set of clays. And so it's, it's interesting in a different way, because here you have to find a different explanation or a different geologic scenario to explain the different kinds of clay groupings that we see. So in this particular image, we see um, this, um, this work has been done by Bethany Aylman. And this, here she's mapped red and um, purple for these two different clay groups. Pr um, the red is a prenite chlorite group, and the purple is, she's mapped it as an illite muscovite, kind of a mica probably. And so you can see the purple here and the red here. And the main thing with the chrism spectra is to see this is the red is different from the purple. And I think most of you in the room, even if you're not a spectroscopist, you can agree with me that the red looks different from the purple. And then after that, we go into the nitty gritty of assigning the minerals and what do we think is there. And then 
arguing forever about what that means, and that's the fun part, but um, usually it goes on for a long time within our team. And did that skip? It did. Okay, so this is another place south of Nili Fossi that we're looking at, and this is called um, Libya Montes. And here um, we have a, a clay outcrop surrounded by olivine and surrounded by pyroxene. So we have layering of these different minerals. And here we see small outcrops of these uh, phyllosilicates. And my student Heather is working on this with me, and also Casey this summer. She's not here today, but she's also working on this. And we're trying to understand the kind of clay that's present here and the nature of the clay and the olivine together in these rocks. And these are a bunch of the images that we see. And this is another crater. In this case, we have these, this thin bright material in the crater walls. And this is what it looks like in the chrism image. And here we see a mixture of clays and sulfates together, which is a little bit unusual. Most of the surface we see either clays or sulfates because usually the clays mean a neutral pH and the sulfates mean an acidic pH. But there are a couple places where we see the two together and we're still working on what that means. Did there are a few occurrences on the Earth as well where we see combinations of clays and sulfates together. So we're trying to understand those and understand better what, what's happening on Mars. And here's another place called Toro Crater. And here there are three um, spots where spectra were collected and those um, spectra are shown here, um, green, blue, and red. And the lab mineral that best matches this end is prenite, a kind of a clay, and then down here an opaline, and remember that's shown in pink, and this one's probably a mixture. And so most of these studies I'm collaborating with some other people, and this one's led by Giuseppe Marzo, who's a postdoc at Ames. And this site, um, Arjar Graben, so <coughs> Um, again, there's a giant feature and there's some clays around the rim here. This is a chrism image and this is what the chrism spectrum looks like. And it looks like a mixture of um, some smectite, probably some magnesium and iron smectite. And there's some other reason, regions around here that have prenite. And this prenite is a high temperature clay. So we're still working out what that means. But in some cases, we're seeing this high temperature clay phase with these clays that are aqueous minerals. and so. Either there were some hydrothermal processes or there could have been some metamorphism. So in summary of what CRISM's been detecting, we see lots of different kinds of clay minerals. And they're found in several places along the, around the planet. So it's not that we're just seeing clays in one little spot and the rest of the planet is barren. We're actually seeing clays in a lot of places. And the theory that's been emerging is that there were probably expansive clay deposits around the planet, maybe everywhere, or maybe in a lot of places, early in the planet's history, about four billion years ago. And then after that, the planet became a little bit more acidic, and we had some sulfate deposits, perhaps about 3.5 billion years ago. And then in the last three billion years or so, things were kind of calm, and not much happened. <laughs> it got kind of dusty. So that's, that's sort of what we understand of Mars. And to understand this further, we look at the meteorites. and. For those of you who haven't heard of a meteorite before, basically a, a rock, a giant asteroid, or some kind of giant rock hits the surface of the planet, makes a big hole, and blasts off some large fragments. And if it's big enough, the piece that flies off, and it can actually make it through Earth's atmosphere and land with something left, then we call it a meteorite. And these can vary in size from teeny tiny to a um, big giant handful, or I think the biggest ones are about that big. And there were several for a long time, and recently there have been a lot more detected. And I wrote that we've detected 34, but I think there are actually a lot more than that now. There've, since people started collecting these in, in the desert in Arabia, we've found a lot more. Good places to detect black asteroids are the white ice in Antarctica and the white sand in the desert. It's a lot easier to find a black rock there. So we can characterize these in the lab then, and these are examples of meteorites from Mars that I've looked at. This is kind of what they look like. They're usually kind of dark with um, different kinds of rock textures. And we look at the spectra. This is the range that CRISM measures, the visible near infrared. And this is the range that TESS looks at, um, the longer wavelengths. And these are some Martian spectra at the bottom. I, di I didn't show Martian spectra here. But um, one thing that you can see is that these spectra don't really look like the Martian spectra. And that's something that 
has been a big question from what the rover data showed. Well, how come the surface of Mars doesn't look like the meteorites? We've been studying these meteorites for 40 years and thought we knew what the planet was. How come what we're seeing now isn't what we thought it was? And so dust is the answer. And the planet is covered by dust. And if you watch the surface for a while, you see these dust devil tracks. So there's um, the dust devils that fly by. They have big dust storms. This is a dust storm. So this is before and this is during. If you look at the planet during a wild dust storm, you don't see much at all. And if you look at the magnets, then you can see that the dust collects on there and then you can study the magnetic properties. So the dust is definitely in flux around the planet. And one question then to think about regarding the dust and the rocks is, is this just sort of drift or just dust that's mobile on the surface and sitting on the rocks and sitting on the, the surface between the rocks? Or is this getting reacted with the rocks and with the soil? And so this is something that my group studied a little bit. What are the reversible processes, the dust that's just in flux, and what's the irreversible processes where you, you actually get cemented soil that forms this sort of dirty crust stuff or a rock varnish? And it looks like we're actually getting this in a lot of cases. So probably water was involved. So either water on a very low level, just diurnally, the, the water over a very long time forms these coatings and cemented crusts, or um, there was enough water when we first started getting these dust, dust occurrences that we formed some of these cemented soils and rock varnishes. But it, it could just be uh, three million years of a little tiny bit of water. And so the final thing I wanted to talk about are analogs. And this is a good way to understand the alteration on Mars by looking at alteration of volcanic sites on the Earth to try to understand what are the minerals that form and how do we characterize them. And so um, I've been to a, a number of sites trying to, trying to answer those questions or sent friends out to collect samples for me. This is from Iceland and here's a hot spring and a cool spring where I've collected the iron oxides to study in the lab. And this is from an acid mine drainage site um, up near Shasta. Iron Mountain, California. <coughs> they, it's a very low pH, I think one and lower. And that's where some of the sulfate minerals were collected. And this is from Yellowstone. There's a giant um, carbonate mound, which looks a little bit like the sulfate mounds we see in Mars, but on a, a much larger scale on Mars. And this is from a hot spring where we see some silica. And this is more al typical alteration of volcanic processes. So this is a Tuya on Iceland. There was um, it's a sub, sub ice, um, yeah, sub ice volcano. There we go. So the volcano <coughs> came through the ice and forms this sort of table to you thing, and then this is a plagonitic tuff. You can see this sort of orange material popping through. So it's sort of like a, a glassy, glassified ash deposit that has a lot of clays that come out of here. And this is near Kilauea, where we see layers of orange and white due to differences in the iron. The iron makes it appear orange. And we've studied both of these materials. And here's some coatings on lavas. And this is then material inside Haleakala, where we have brightly colored material around the cinder cones and more sort of brownish material forming around the, around the crater basin. So again, we collect this material and then bring it in the lab and measure mineralogy through X-ray diffraction and measure the spectra in the visible near infrared like chrism and in the longer wavelength region like TESS so that we can compare these. I think I hopped over something. And this is the, the samples from, um, from Iron Mountain, the very low pH rocks, uh, sulfate rocks. And these are Mossbauer data. Um, so this tells you about the iron in the sample. And this, for example, is what the Mossbauer data from Gusev and Meridiani. And then th this is the Mossbauer data of a bunch of sulfate rocks. And this is the, this green one here is this green rock here. And then, Again, these are the spectra that correspond to the spectra that the rover is collecting. And this is from some of the rocks at, at Iceland that we studied. The same thing is plagnetic tuff, and then these, these altered parts that are called pillows. It doesn't look very comfortable, but these sort of pillow bombs that roll down the volcano, um, they're about the size of a pillow maybe, and then some of them alter. Um, and this is, a, this is probably the size of a fist, this piece that um, altered off of here. And so again, we measure, this is the spectral region that PanCam on the rover collects, and this is X-ray diffraction to get mineralogy, and this is the wavelength range of the mini tests on the rover. And this is the Kilauea site, so these are the layers where we see jarosite and 
um, opaline silica, which is similar to what we've seen on Mars, and look at SEM in the laboratory, which we can't do on Mars. But we can use all these techniques in the lab to try to understand better what the material is. So we're using all these analog sites for ground toothing. And this is the last one. Um, Nancy and I and Eldar is at JPL. He came with us to look at the Petrified Forest National Park. It's actually called the Painted Desert. And if you look at these layers, we were interested in studying this for Mars because the clays, you seem to see similar layering of the clay units in throughout the whole area. So it's similar to Mars where you see layers of clays and they seem to be broad expanses and you see, you know, these little table things poking up with the different layers of the clays, but they're similar throughout the whole region. And so again, we combine all our resources in order to learn information about the Martian surface. And these are some of the people who've helped with all this work. Um, some of them are in the room here, Mario and Nancy and Heather. And these are students from um, during the year. Trevor and Elena aren't here now. And Alicia was here one summer. And um, Nancy and Drew, they were here past summers. Rose and Lucas are research assistants. So that's that. Thank you all for listening. I was wondering when you're talking about the meteorites from Mars, how does one know that they're actually from Mars and not from some other body? Usually they, they use the, um, the gas inclusions in the rock. So you can tell a little bit by the mineralogy and petrology, but the ringer was that the, the oxygen isotopes, so I, I hope that means something to some of you at least, that if you look at the oxygen isotopes on the Earth, the 0, 16, 17, 18 ratios, you can tell, aha, this is an earth rock, or this, you know, this, this gas that we tested came from earth. And if you actually look at these from the moon and from Mars, they make a different curve. So that was sort of the ringer that told them, because you could find some rocks on the um, earth that might look like meteorites in terms of the iron. The, the iron um, tends to be higher, and also, um, let's see, I think the iron's higher and the aluminum's lower, but there are people who study a lot of basaltic rocks, and the, the rocks from Mars are a little bit different in the mineralogy. But if you actually measure these 0, 16, 17, 18 ratios, you can plot sort of for everything probably in the solar system. But I know at least Earth has a line, and the Moon has a line, and Mars has a line. So you can definitively say that it's from a different place. And I, I think when they first measured the, Martian, the first Martian meteorite, they probably didn't know. They just said, oh, this one's different. Hmm. But then once we got, you know, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 30, then we could say, aha, all the Martian meteorites have the same oxygen isotope ratio, and now we're pretty certain about that. I don't think we've done that, no. But we have um, other parameters that they've, they've measured um, the ratios of like neon and argon gases, that some other things that we can measure actually in the atmosphere. And these isotope ratios you can measure in the lab here, but I don't think we've sent anything that's measured, at least as far as I know, we haven't measured isotopes in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'd like to ask why, um, I don't know if you can go back to your Marth slide, but why everything seems to have a red slope on it. Is that just an effect of the dust you compared? I think you give a spo four lab spectra and four orbital spectra on Marth. And there is a strong slope. There was a strong red slope in all the Mars spectra. Let me see if I can get there. There is a strong slope, and um, I think it's going to run away. <coughs> there we go. And we're actually using the difference in the slope to characterize the surface because the slope. Um, oh, let's. Before I go on, I'm going to show you. If you look at um, this olivine spectrum here, olivine has ferrous iron in it, iron 2, and so you see this slope going from lower to higher, which is caused by um, many kinds of iron two iron ferrous minerals. And then let's go on. I think we're almost there. Here we go. OK. So this is this slope that you see. And it's present in a lot of this region. And I think some of this could be due to the dust. 
But something else we're looking at is comparing regions. And what we've noticed is that uh, we see a steeper slope at the boundary of this nontronite with the, um, the blue, the, the nontronite's mapped in orange, and the blue is the aluminum phyllosilicates. And what I've used for the green color here is actually it's an olivine detector. And so it's a measure of the slope. It's a measure of this ferrous slope. And so at the boundary between the nontronite and the clays, we're seeing a steeper slope. And this opal material seems to be in there, too. So you can kind of see that the slope's steeper for the green spectrum than for the others. And usually we look at ratio spectra. These are not ratios, so you can see the full slope here. If, if you're doing a ratio of something with a slope to something else with a slope, then you might lose the slope. So you might have seen other people present spectra that didn't show this because they were using ratios. But what we're looking at is the change in slope here to try to determine differences in the mineralogy as well. So there, there does seem to be a slope everywhere, which is probably due to some dust or some other component. But there, there tends to be this whole green region in between the orange and the blue that has a greater slope. And we think that that's probably from something like a ferrous mica. And it could be that there's a ferrous mica everywhere um, and to some extent. But it, it looks like there's this region where there's more of this green phase. And some, some iron clays, like a chlorite, um, some of our colleagues are looking at mixtures of this iron bearing, ferrous iron bearing clay with other clays to try to understand the mixture properties. So what if you've got some of this ferrous clay in there? How does it affect the slope? And is it nonlinear or linear when you do mixtures of, of these materials? Uh, but when, we, when you do coatings on materials, usually you get a slope going the other way. So if it's a, a thin coating, it should go this way. And so why we're seeing the slope this direction, we're still working on, because usually this is indicative of a ferrous kind of phase. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask if you'd uh, done any studies looking at uh, <coughs> material, like I know that some of the dust dunes have been cemented, and so they're, they're no longer mobile, and compared that to m dust that is mobile using GRISM data? Um, what we have done um, in some of the, the Hawaiian, the, the ash deposits on the <coughs> Hawaiian islands and on Iceland, I've, I've looked at these places where there's sort of a cemented crust and collect those in the lab. And often they're, they're really um, fragile so that if you pick it up, it actually crumbles. So that, in that kind of a case, um, it's you know, probably not going to last a real long time on Mars. But we, I've done some experiments in the lab too, mixing some sulfate in with some clays and then just doing some wet dry cycling. So putting a little bit of water on there to sort of glue everything together and just not doing anything, just letting it dry out so it's wet dry, wet dry. And then it tends to form this hard crust. And if there's a little sulfate, then it forms a really hard crust. And so that could be the glue that um, we're seeing on Mars to make these crusts because there is a few percent sulfate everywhere. So on Mars, the sulfate is one of the questions with the dust because we, we see the sulfate minerals in some of the rocks, but what about this sulfur that's in the dust? And we always assumed it's a sulfate because it's so oxidized, but what kind of sulfate? We haven't really seen anything yet that gives us an idea of the mineralogy that any of the instruments we've sent so far haven't really told us, ah, the dust has the properties of this sulfate mineral. We're kind of missing that. So that the only sulfates we really saw from the rovers were in this bright yellow and white stuff that was underneath the surface. And so there we, we know what the sulfates are, but this 6% or so, 6 to 8% SO3 that's in the actual brown generic surface dust. We don't really know what that is yet. And so whatever it is, though, it could be you know, sticky. So it could be <laughs> the glue that's when, when you do the wet dry cycling of the mostly sort of clay and fine grained um, glassy dust particles with a little bit of that sulfate that could be the, the kind of glue to make the more permanent kinds of, of dirt crust. And, and also on the rock surfaces, we've done some tests with just taking a, a clay rock and sprinkling a little bit of different dust phases on the surface and seeing what the spectral properties look like. But we haven't tried yet then to add like a sulfate component and make like a, a kind of a, a varnish. We haven't tried that, but that might be an interesting thing to try. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned uh, <coughs> metamorphic rocks uh, on Mars. When was that supposed to occur on Mars? Um, that's a very good question, and I, I think uh, that's what people are trying to figure out with, you know, if, if we had like this prenite there, how did it form? Because it's a high temperature clay. 
and we've seen it in at least three locations now where <coughs> it has a couple distinct, it has two, at least two distinct features in the spectral, in the spectrum. So we can, we're really sure that that's what it is. It's not something else that's masquerading as prehnite. And so, and it's occurring in these three places. So how did it form? And it's not just one occurrence, but there must have been some kind of pervasive, either it was a hydrothermal kind of event or, I don't know, that people have thrown out metamorphism, but I don't think anyone can really explain when did the metamorphism occur or how, or because we don't have a good explanation for that. Um, but there was some kind of a high temperature process in three locations at some point that formed this. But that's a good question, and maybe you can help work on it. <laughs> Hi, your um, Mars polar lander information was showing that the the that fact that the stuff was sublimating the the soil itself was somewhat moist. Uh, it wasn't until it actually uh, dried out that you could get it in the little oven. Well, you didn't do the data. Have you? This was due to salt, as far as I understand. Have you found salts elsewhere, or can you see them from Chisholm? Uh, we Chisholm? have not seen perchlorate salts yet okay. um, with Chisholm and. It could be that the perchlorates are not on the surface, but also the, the perchlorates, the, the bands that they're using to identify, I mean, the people who've measured spectra of the perchlorates, they're really broad water, broad water bands. And so it could be that, and it's only a couple percent. So when you're looking at 100% of the soil and there's 2% perchlorate and it's distinguished by a very broad water band, it's hard to know, are you seeing water in opal or water in ferry hydrite or water in a clay? Um, and at that level, it's really hard to distinct. So it, it could be that there is a little bit of perchlorite that's mixed in there and we're just not able to detect it with chrism. Um, but it, it's likely that it's more detectable under the surface. So like with Phoenix, right, right on the surface, they might not have seen too much, but when they scooped off the surface and then scooped out yeah, there, I think that like the ice and the carbonates and the perchlorates were just even you know, a millimeter down would probably be preserved. So that's where it could be. So that's one of the problems from orbit that you're seeing the surface and you're, you'd have to send a lot of rovers to dig up some of this white and yellow stuff from underneath to get you know, enough to see it at an 18 meter resolution. 18 meters is kind of a lot compared to the size of the rover and the little tracks that they make. but. Um, I guess if you send them back and forth a few times, you could get 18 meters. Um, but it would be nice just you know, for the whole ground truthing cycle to be able to, we would love with CRISM to be able to get a spectrum of this yellow and white stuff, for example. Um, or where Phoenix was, if Phoenix you know, could have dug a little bit more, a bigger hole, <laughs> maybe we could have measured it with CRISM. But um, the little holes Phoenix dug were too small. We, we weren't able to get a spectrum of that. Um, if not, then in gratitude, I'd like to offer a SETI Institute pin to our speaker. Wonderful. Janice. Thank you. <laughs> thank and you. let's thank her one more time.